my. I love my phone, but sometimes it doesn't love me back. It's a good time to pray. Father God, we bow before you as we open up your word. We pray, Lord, that by the power of your spirit that you unlock it into our hearts that takes root there, Lord, that we not just uh, be looking at it for a minute and forget it before we hit the church doors, but that it would be words of life showing us the way that we should live and how we should live. That we know you're talking directly to our hearts, Lord. That we may join you in what you're doing and glorify you in it, Lord. Praise you, Lord, that we get to follow you in this world. In Jesus' precious name, Lord, that we pray. Amen. I have remarked throughout the week in my little videos that I put out there on YouTube about how folks focus on odd things. Whether or not I had a video where, my goodness, I had I must have scraped my nose and I said, no, it's just a spot on my nose. Don't worry about what's the spot on my nose. It's not, I'm not growing a horn. I mean, I was up here doing a video where I hadn't really thought about it, but I was I had a local hot dog place advertised on my shirt. And some people were like, hey, great message, but why were you wearing the hot dog shirt? Are they paying you to endorse them? It's like, no, you're missing the point. I was talking about Jesus and how great it is to get outside the four church walls and tell people about Jesus. But people worry about other things. I could say, hey, what's really going on this week? And people say, well, you know, they're selling candy corn in July. And I said, is that really what's important in the, in the world today? You know, I asked someone, what's going on? Are there actually UFOs out there? Did I miss that part? You know, don't ask me about that. That's, let's not be distracted. But sometimes you've got a clear idea of what's important, and sometimes you want to tell people what's important, and they'll focus on other things. Or have you ever wanted to share something important with somebody? And that's the part, and that's the point where you say, well, you know, you left the light on back in the laundry room today. You know? I do that kind of stuff, but it's like, never mind, you know, or you're trying to tell, you know, your friends about, it could be that you were really excited that, that maybe a, that in recent days, maybe the pirates won a game. Did they win something in the last week? At least once, you know, and for some people that's cause for celebration, but some other people could really care less, but there are important things going on. Sometimes people miss what the main thing is. And I encourage you to be focused on the main thing. And in case you don't know, that main thing in our lives, there are lots of things we could be focused on, but our main thing is following the Lord. Now, if you remember, this whole last month, I've been talking about the vision from God that Peter had about reaching the whole world, all the Gentiles, for Jesus. And it took a little while to get that from just really literally up in the sky in this great vision of this great sheet coming down filled with all sorts of animals and, and birds and reptiles where some of that thing was were things that Peter weren't, didn't, weren't supposed to touch or look at or even taste, you know, let alone eat. But God said, hey, don't treat those things that I've said that are okay and clean now as uncommon or, or unclean. And that was a message where it wasn't really about dietary laws. It was really about people or people. Anytime, anywhere, any place, you can tell people about Jesus. And that took a little while to get it from there to here, into his heart, and out into the world. And some, pe some people still struggle with that, that Jesus is for everybody. And I pray you're not one of those folks. Because we know in our heads Jesus is for everybody, but sometimes we act like we should keep Jesus to ourselves. And I'm not sure what it's going to take to snap us out of that. I mean, it took a lot to get the Apostle Peter on the right track. I remember, I'm not advertising anything that people do on TV, but there was a, there was a comedy magic team, Penn and Teller, um, Penn Gillette, the big guy, in that uh, that team put out a video years ago where I mean he is 
as far as I know, unless unless you find evidence to the contrary, he's an atheist. And it has makes no bones about that. But he had some guy come up to him and share a Bible with him, you know, and talk to him about that. And he, he valued the guy being very sincere. And what he says is, if you're a person of faith and you're not going out there trying to win people over for your religion, then he has no respect for you. Because really, if you believe that, you should do something about it. And he put it this way. And I'm, you know, sometimes I put that video up here, but I'll just give you the abbreviated thing. He says, I want you to imagine that, that you and I are out there by the road and you see that there's this big Mack truck bearing down on me. And if something doesn't happen, it's going to run, it's going to run you over. And I say, how much do I not ha have, how much do I have to hate you not to move you out of the way at, or at least do something to get to save you? He says, but because really the reality is if I believe that truck could run you over and kill you, I need to do something about it. And he said, and I said, well, of course you would do something about it. And he says, and that's the way it ought to be with our faith. We know that unless you do something about it, if I believe, if I really believe what I believe that Jesus is the only one that saves, if I don't tell you that, if I don't share that with you, I'm, there must be something bigger in my life than Jesus, why I don't share that. Because it is, if I believe that's a matter of life and death, I better do something about it. You know, and an atheist was talking about that. He sees that, and so should we. So the news of what Peter did, and you say, what did Peter do? And in case you weren't paying attention, there he was, he had received this message that he needed to meet this man, Cornelius, Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He had got this, myth, this, this message from an angel that he needed to see Peter, that Peter was going to share with him the words of salvation. So he sent for Peter. Peter agreed to come, went to the Gentiles' house, shared the word of God, and it says while he was still speaking, and Peter retells this story when he gets home, that the Holy Spirit was poured up on everyone and they all repented. They all came to God by faith. They all got saved. Glory, hallelujah. Awesome stuff going on in that Gentile's house. And word of this traveled even before I think Peter got home. So people were talking about it. People knew what had happened. So there it was. And it says, and the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea, it's a larger area around Jerusalem, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when, let me pick it up in verse two. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. And what is there to criticize? I mean, hadn't revival broken out just, you know, several miles, you know, several miles away from there. I mean, the news had traveled fast. You know, had people gotten it wrong? I mean, people received the Holy Spirit. People got saved. There were believers all over the place, gathered, scattered. I mean, they were there. They knew what this meant. And yet, for some reason, they were criticizing what Peter had done. And when they were talking about criticizing, it was this whole idea, what happens when people criticize you? Sometimes it's a mix of the bad and the good. It's like, oh, great that you led those people to the Lord, but you know what? What happened there? Uh, well, there's some things that we have, you know, we don't like. You know, they go back and forth, and there's also, you know, people criticize you, they're doing what? They're judging you in some way. You know, you might think that you're good as gold, but some people always have something to say about what you did, right? They would have done it another way, right? Have you noticed that with people, that everyone else knows a better way than you do? Just once. Wouldn't it be great if someone came up and just said, everything that you're telling me is great, and they had nothing else to add to the conversation. But people have their opinions, and here they have their religious opinions. And they say, well, what, what, what could have Peter done wrong? It all sounds so good. They said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men, and you ate with them. And you're like, what? That's kind of like me talking about the candy corn tie. 
It's not a big deal. Who cares about candy corn? I mean, I happen to love it, but you know, some of you might hate it. But that's not what I'm preaching about today, all right? Didn't, didn't you hear the news that all that literally tons of people got saved, that they received God in a glorious way like we did on the day of Pentecost? Isn't that awesome? Yeah, but you know what? You were in some unclean people's houses, you know, and you even had a sandwich with those people. And you're thinking, so? But there are things that are important to other people that are not important to you. And you're trying to say, but this is the important part. You know, it's this big. I can't even get my arms out wide. God is so good. And they're focused on what you think is the little stuff. Understand that there were people of the day, and that's why they keep bringing up the circumcised thing and the uncircumcised thing. There were people who really believed. It's like, well, as Jewish believers who were formerly not believers in Christ, they were just plain old Jewish folks who were circumcised. And if you're not sure what that means, talk to me about it after church. You know, I'm not going to have one. I have to explain that to you. They were, they felt that that was a mark of their salvation, that they, that was a mark of being set apart from God. That was a mark of obedience. That was a sign of their religion, their relationship with God. And they really believed that that part of the Jewish heritage needed to be held on to. And there was actually a party of, I never want to go to that party. So I make that joke, joke in church. The party of the circumcision where they said, hey, you got to be Jew first, then you come to know Jesus, just like we did. I mean, that's the way it ought to go. And that would be a fight in the church that will last for a little while. And Peter and Paul will get together and talk about that. And it will be ultimately decided that, no, you don't need to be circumcised to come to know Jesus. It'll be all right. But in the moment, they were a party of opposition saying, well, you know, if you're not circumcised, really they're saying you ain't right. You're still, they're still holding up this whole thing. You were with that. You were with those people. You were with, were with, you might as well just say dirty people, you know, ceremonial unclean. You were with, and you ate food with them. You know, that's just wrong. And if I had come, and if I had come in here with that with that news, I mean, and I and I have been around people with that news, where I was all excited. I mean, where I have seen people, act, you know, literally come to know the Lord, and I share that with people. I mean, there was a time when we were when we were in Philadelphia before we came here. I mean, people were getting saved every month. People were getting baptized every month. Life was good, and you share that good news with people, and you say, and they would say. Well, you know, he still is probably going to drink, right? Or, you know, he's still going to be hanging out with those same people. You know, and you're just sitting here and say, excuse me? Did you not hear the part where I say that, you know, that Joe got saved? And, and at some point, I, I, I wish the Lord would give me those words to, to say in a Christian way. There's got to be a Christian way in love to say, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> Did you just hear what I just said? The most amazing thing that could happen in a person's life that they come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior just happened. And you're worried about, well, you know, they're still going to wear those ugly clothes to church, right? What? You know, this is not important. But we don't. We live in an age where we don't want to offend people or hurt anyone's feelings. And, you know, it just, it, people amaze me. So Peter had to back up. In the, and in the verses between 3 and 13, I'm not sharing, but he has to justify himself and explain why going into the Gentile's house to eat a sandwich, you know, or whatever he did. I mean, we know he broke bread with them, but he was in their house sharing the gospel, and he almost, and he had to just break it down. It's like, this is why this was okay. And he talks about that, he, he, re, he retells this story about how he went into a trance when he was praying on the rooftop how he got a divine revelation and visitation from God. He had that whole vision thing going on. The men from Cornelius' house showed up. That was another sign and confirmation. This is what God was at, at work, that Cornelius himself had had a vision, and Peter's vision and Cornelius' vision all come together as a message from God saying about the growth of the church and how the church would expand into the Gentile world. And isn't that amazing? 
And he said, and then he picks it up. He says, and he told us that he had seen an angel in his house. He said, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter, and he will bring you a message through you, which for all your household will be saved. You know, he had to underscore that. It's like, I was contacted by God himself. Someone else was contacted by God himself through an angel to bring us together with a message that was going to save everyone there, Cornelius, his friends, his family, all those folks. And that's one of those verses, if we take it out of context, that you get the idea that some people think Cornelius heard the message and everyone around him got saved just by, you know, they were by association. And they say, no, they all heard the message of salvation and they all got saved. All who heard it got saved. And I could say that because it didn't it didn't leave anybody out saying, oh yeah, and there was those two people in the corner and never got the message and they didn't get saved. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't say that. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take it as a matter of fact that everyone got saved. And if we didn't know that's what was going on, because some people say, oh, that Cornelius and these other people were God fearers, they must have already been saved. Well, if they were already saved, why is it they had to, had to hear the message of salvation? Why is it that Peter had to be sent? and called for, and he had to show up and tell them about Jesus, as if they already knew Jesus. They needed to hear the message of, of Jesus. They needed to hear that and to have an opportunity to repent and receive the Holy Spirit, just like all the other believers. And it was a replication, and if you will, a reflection of what happened on the day of Pentecost in the Gentile world. And he says, and as I began to speak, so the Holy Spirit came upon them as he had come on us in the beginning. And what happened in the beginning? Pentecost. That was at that point there where they were focused on the whole being in the house with Gentiles and eating a sandwich. And hopefully by this point, it's like, boom! And they received the Holy Spirit. And if that wasn't enough, he said, and here's the breakthrough moment he shared with them. In verse 16. Then I remembered, he said, what the Lord, and he talks about, he's talking about Jesus. He says, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He says, that is the, he says, so then God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. In case they hadn't figured it out, it's like they received the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That they received the same gift that God gave us. And why did he give it to us? He explains it right there. Who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? That they trusted their lives over to Jesus Christ. They met, they stretched out their faith and they were, they were blessed by God himself. That gift. And what is a gift? Now, if it's a good gift, I mean, okay, who has, who's had that, who's received gift where it's like, I'm giving you something but I expect you to give me something back down the road. Wink, wink. You know what I mean? It's like, if you have those people in your life, you know, you can't, they, if they give you something, it's like, oh, I got to run out to the store and get them something because they got me something. I mean, I got plenty of people, those, I mean, who just don't get the idea of what a gift is. A gift should be no strings attached. Oh, so-and-so gave me a present on my birthday. Now it's like, oh, when is their birthday? So I got to make this even. And if I don't make it even, they're going to be mad. I'm just letting you know, that's not how good gift giving goes. And here, it is that same gift where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, where he says, where he's asking her to give, give him a drink of water, and she says, you don't have anything to, get, to draw water with. And he said, if you understood the gift of God and who it was who was speaking to you, you would ask me to give you something to drink. And that's that whole conversation about living water that where people get thirsty on regular water, always looking for something to drink, but the water that God gives will be overflowing in your life, never go away. It is that same use of that word gift in Acts chapter two, verse 38, where it says, if you come to know Jesus, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same gift he's talking about here that God give, gives us who believe in the Lord Jesus. And he asks that question. 
where it said, in your translation, it might say, and who was I to think I could stand in God's way? But literally, for all you, you students of Greek, and I, I don't want to dwell there, he says, he really says, who am I to think that I am able to withstand God or get in God's way? Is there anyone here who, think, who thinks that they are, are able to stand up against what God could do? You know, you put your arm on the table and say, let's go, let's go. No, never going to happen. And people, and people ask me a related question. Well, well, if I don't help out, if I don't do it, is, is God still going to do it? God will find a way. And say, well, then it doesn't make a difference if I help out or not. God will find somebody else. There's millions of people that God can call. But understand that God has things worked out and God has a preferred way that, that you are involved. I mean, there's some people in the great chain. I mean, you can read those stories of how like folks like Billy Graham got called and it was from, from people along the way that you probably never heard of who influenced him to put him on that path. And then we know how that story goes. And maybe it would have worked out another way with other people. You know, but the, the big picture is, if not through you, through someone else. You know, but here's the thing. Why would you resist it? Why would you tell God no? Why would you say, oh, no, why I would prefer it like Moses. Why would you say, oh, go another way. Use somebody else. You know, don't you believe that God knows what he's doing? And when he when it's clear that he wants to use you and he's calling you and you get the word from God that you say, you know, I believe that God wants me to do this. But, you know, I think I know better than God. I won't do that. Or this is not a good time for me. You don't think God knows all the, all the timings of your life and what's going on in your life and what's best? Come on now. And I always, I often pray, Lord, that you would work through me and not in spite of me. That God doesn't have to drag me into anything. That I don't have to be resistant. That I don't try to do it halfway or even my own way. That I just see, Lord, what would you have me do and go that way? Why? Because God says so. That's why it's important that we get involved in it. That we just don't say, eh, someone else can do it. God is talking to you. God is talking to all of us. And God desires that all of us work together. You know, it's part of the deal, okay? If you know Jesus, you know that you're supposed to follow him. God is in charge. I don't want to have to dumb that down and explain that and twist any arms. I mean, you talk to God about it. I mean, he says, let's go, and we go. Sometimes we're a little slow in responding, in responding but God understands us, God works with us, and God leads the way. But I would never want you, sometimes we're in that spot where it's like, like when your parents tell you to do something and eventually they wear you down and you say, okay, I'll do it if you say so. And in the back of their mind, they're thinking, I better get something for this. And sometimes we're that way as Christians too. Oh yes, I'll follow God, but I hope I get something out of this. I hope someone recognizes me. I hope I get blessed for this. And, so, and just truth be told, some of that's even mixed into the teaching and philosophy and preach, you know, theology and preaching out there. That's like, if you want, if you want blessings in this world, you need to bless somebody else. You know, if you want, God calls us by grace. God saves us by grace. God leads us so we're not expecting to get rewarded. You know, we're not going to earn our way to heaven. We just, we just live it for free and serve God, praising God. That it's not a chore to serve God. It may feel like that sometimes because there are certain things that you don't want to do because you are in process. I'll just slow down for a minute. Because you are in process of being taught and shaped into the vision and image of God in this world. I mean, just truth be told, when we get saved, when we first become Christians, when you first become born again, however you describe that, you're not perfect. You're not where God wants you to be. There's some, there's some rough spots in your life. There are things that need to be changed. There's things that need to be trimmed out, pulled out, thrown away, forgotten about. Things that need, need to be out of the way so they don't get in the way, so you can just walk in the way. God has work to do in our lives. 
And there are moments when he's got to pull, it feels like he's got to pull us and push us more than just us happily following him. We're a works in progress and God will work on us and we by obedience and submission and surrender hopefully become more wiser here and here to say, you know, God, I wasn't sure how that was going to work out, but you're right. And I pray that your life is spent more in just agreeing with God saying, well, you know, up until this point, Lord, you know exactly what you've been talking about. You've been showing the way, leading the way, blessing me. I've been trusting you and you keep showing up. I bet you you're going to keep doing that. Why should I? At some point, I just need to stop asking God and arguing with God and just do more of the agreeing with God and walking greater and greater in faith and allowing my faith to grow in Christ and just saying, yes, Lord, to being the willing, the willing available servant. He's saying, I'm saying, I'm not there yet, but God will get you there if you allow him. Yes, I do need to take a breath after all that. But that he would work, it would be something that isn't a chore anymore and it becomes something you cherish. And you realize that God didn't have to do this. There's nothing special about me to do this, but he chose me anyhow because that's what he wanted to do. God knows what he's doing more than I ever would. And he's talked to me and he said, follow me. Just like those fishermen and tax collectors, you know, and all the, and all the apostles who were not special people, God just said, come with me. I got a plan for you. He could have picked the best and the brightest, but he picked regular folks to do extraordinary things. So people wouldn't look at this, you know, how special the people were and get confused and say, oh, it's because they were just so talented and, and smart, you know, and well-placed and well-to-do. No, they were just regular folks. How, what would account for this miracle, this blessing? Well, not looking at those regular folks, it must have been a divine thing. It must have been God at work, that God would get the glory and not us. And here's the good news out of this story. And when they had heard this, those circumcised believers, the people that were giving Peter a fit, when they heard this, they had no further objections. Literally, they were silent and really couldn't say anything. There were no further objections because they just got told. They were just informed, this is the deal. You shouldn't have anything to say. So they were showing some wisdom there and they just... And then immediately they started, they realized, I need to be quiet about what I thought was important and start praising God. And that's what they did. They were glorifying God saying, so then, and this would, this would make, make the best sermon, uh, the best uh, hymn title. So then even Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. You need to work on that one and make it into a song, but that you would sing in church. So they realized and that's why they were praising God. God had a breakthrough after hearing all of those things that Peter had said. So then they realized that even the Gentiles, those unwashed, those uncircumcised, those unholy people, so up until now, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have, obviously we wouldn't have sat in their house and had a meal, but God took those people and has provided a way Granted repentance, because repentance is about turning your life all around. And you can't do that all by yourself. That's a God thing. That's a God gift. And so he's underlining that, that they were able to turn their lives around through God at the level that leads to eternal life. Because I could talk all day long how I'm going to fix my life, how I'm going to change my life, how I'm going to get better, how I'm going to stop doing that. And I vow to, and I promise, but... Unless God is in it, it's not going to happen. God breaks you down, humbles you. God leads you. God gives you the faith. God makes a way. We don't decide to follow Jesus, even though that's what that one hymn says. Jesus extends his hand and we take it and we follow him. It's all him. We do nothing. We bring nothing to the table to be saved. God does all the heavy lifting. He just requires us to take that step of faith and trust in him. And God provides all everything else you'll ever need. 
Now, is that the end of the story where everyone is, is hugging that out and saying, glad all you un, unwashed, dirty people are in the church now? No. They're still going to be not liking that. But, and I would say to all the folks who kind of look at people funny because they're not like you, it's like, well, we've never had people like that in the church. Hmm. I wonder if they're really saved. People think that way. I tell you a quick story. I and mean, when I talk about people, I'm not really talking about them. I'm just talking about what we did. When we were in, in Baltimore, and this is my own foolishness talking here, and I'll wrap this up. I was told by some well-meaning church folks that the people, there's a church, it was a church was on the corner, right? It had been there forever, like from the beginning of when Baltimore became a city. It was, I don't know, at that point, a couple hundred years old almost, I'm sure. And they said, you know, the people from the neighborhood they really don't come in and join our church. They come in and see what we do, and then they don't like it, and they leave. So, and they, they the point being, it's like, you know, they're not like us, and they don't like what we do, so we're not really expecting that they're going to come in and be part of what we do. And then, and you can figure out who I'm talking about, the pastor of that church, who lived next door to the church, started inviting people in the neighborhood to church started sharing Jesus with the people in the neighborhood and people got saved and they started joining the church to where the number of people from the neighborhood was getting kind of close to the number of people that were going to church in the first place or at least it was enough where it's like oh those people aren't going anywhere are they now what And in a small way, it's like I'm, I'm relating to what the Apostle Peter went through when he was like, isn't it great that so-and-so who's joined the church, he got baptized and all of that? Well, you know, their kids don't know how to act in church, right, Pastor Bob? You know, and it's like, and not so subtly telling me, you know, we had concerns about these things. And we told you that when you first became pastor. And it's like, oh, you did not just tell me that. Yeah, you did. And it's like, didn't you hear the part where they got saved, they're coming to church and they, you know, and they're loving that they could serve God here? Why are we talking about these other things? People, just like these ones here, they were okay with, you know, oh, the Gentiles are getting saved and great, but it's like, uh, wouldn't it be nice if they were going to church somewhere else, Pastor Bob? I mean, people, I mean, people think like that. But those walls and barriers, and we can say prejudices and, and bigoted thoughts that we have against other believers, people who aren't like us, people that we come in contact with out there, we have to be like Peter and like these people of the opposition party, the circumcision party, who had this mental block about what a Christian should be like and how they should act and, and what hoops they need to jump through, that God breaks down those barriers. God will take that stuff away if we let him. Some folks will hold on to those differences and barriers to the day they die. You know, and, I, and we can only spend so much air talking to them about it. Saying, can't you see? They're just like us. Kind of like watching the progression. I, mean, I, I watch All in the Family at, on late night TV. That in the beginning, Archie Bunker was terrible. But at, through the years, I mean, he was still terrible. But, <laughs> God, but you could tell the truth was working on his heart. And he, real, and, he became, and he slowly became aware of people are just people. You know, barriers. I mean, he still had his foolish thoughts but less and less. And I'm not saying that's the work of the Holy Spirit, but I know on the flip side of that in our own lives that the work of the Holy Spirit will cause greater changes in our lives. Things that we thought were important that we needed to hold on to, religious traditions, viewpoints, the way we come to know the Lord, you know, different, you know, different Christian traditions, 
I mean, are they just as valuable as what we do here? Can you come from that church and be a member of this church? Do we need to straighten you out before you become a member of this church? Do we need to instruct you in the proper way of, of, of knowing and worshiping Jesus? I mean, we have all sorts of thoughts. But what's the important thing? That people know the Lord by faith and receive his grace. Forgiveness. I mean, let's keep the main thing the main thing. And not put up uh, you know, special hoops for people to jump through. They don't need to become like you. They need to become more like Jesus. That's all I got to say about that. We should pray. Father God, we love you. And truly, your vision that none should perish and all should have everlasting life, that all should come to know your son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That that is something that we should not just keep inside these four walls, Lord. It should be a message in our heart that we take with us outside of these walls, wherever we go, anywhere, any, any place, any time, anyone. And let them know the truth that sets them free, that they would have life, life abundant. That their life wouldn't have to lead to destruction, but lead to glory for all who believe. Whatever holds us back, Lord, that you would, uh, you would unlock us, you would, un you would just break down those walls in our lives that keep us from sharing, that keep us from loving, that keep us from being more merciful and compassionate, Lord. Help us love people better in your name. Well, Lord, we pray that your spirit would, uh, would loosen us up and make us bold before the world and love folks as you've called us to love them. May we always do it in love and in grace. I pray that in telling the truth that folks who, are, who, have, who have issues that, they'll, that the Lord will make them silent and they'll raise their voices in praise and join us in praising you for what you're doing out there and what you do in our hearts and our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your holy name that we pray and we thank you. Amen. Now, my friends, I pray that uh, the word of God has blessed you today. And if you, at the end of all of us, saying, you know, I need to know that Jesus. I need to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Don't just slip out the door today. We have time to sit and pray about the most important thing in your life, that you know the Lord. If you've got questions about, well, if I go to the farm show, how is it? What do I need to do? About praying with folks, about sharing the gospel, about handing out Bibles. If you're concerned about things, you're, if you're actually afraid of certain things, we can work you through that. We'll pray you through that. It'll be all right. You won't be there alone. We're in this together. If there are things that you need to pray about today, stay and we'll pray. However God works that out today, you listen, you follow, you praise God. Let us stand and sing together. Hymn number 447, Trust and Obey. Brother Paul. First and last, four, four, seven. 